rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 2,445. We're going to have some fun today, so be prepared to be inspired. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah! Today I'm in beautiful Parker, Colorado, with a very special guest by the name of Michael Cotsworth. Michael, welcome to Cars Yeah! Do you have any gear, and are you ready to release the clutch? Thank you, Mark. I am ready. I'm just waiting for the green flag. All right, and you're a guy who knows all about that with your driving past and all your ties to cars, and we're going to have a lot of fun learning more about you. But first, I always kind of break the ice with this question. What's one little thing that people don't know about you, Michael? I wonder how to answer that. You know, how, you know, how intimate should I get? But I'll make it It's all up clear. to you. It's your show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'll just say that I think um, I keep kind of under the uh, down low. Um, I am a cum laude graduate of an, of an Ivy League college. Wow. Okay. Very nice. What'd you, what was your major or majors? Well, um, I went to Dartmouth College, and my first major was psychology. I finished that up, and then I basically created an environmental studies major. Uh, we're talking in the late 60s, early 70s, where that was just starting to become a thing, and I actually created that major for the college. And then I had enough credits for a third major in Greek and Roman studies. Holy cow. So a nice liberal arts <laughs> you know, kind of education. Quite the academic. Wow. Well, my <laughs> first, I couldn't, you know, when you're that age, you have no idea what you want to do, at least. I didn't. And my first year no, was, I, no. yeah, my first year was, uh, I was a communications major uh, with a psychology minor. And my daughter ended up getting two degrees in four years from the University of Redlands. And one of them was a psychology of marketing along with a business degree, ah. which kind of made some sense, right? Why do people buy? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. Psychology is always useful. Uh, yes. <laughs> Trying to figure everyone out. That's for sure. And Dartmouth, what a great school. So bravo to you. Well, let me give you an introduction here. Michael Cotsworth is the founder and president of Car Connections, the president of Automotive Consulting Network and the executive producer at ACP Productions. Yeah, he, he's not much of a go-getter, as we've learned from his college experience <laughs> in his life. Holy cow, dude. <laughs> he was, uh, or he has been an automotive enthusiast for over 50 years, working as a publisher, a writer, a speaker, a radio personality, as you can tell from that great voice, driving instructor, and an automotive consultant. He's been active in an automotive, as an automotive collector, restorer, and vintage racer since 1977. Michael is the founder and past president of Rocky Mountain Automotive Press, past president of director of Ferrari Owners Club and Classic Sports Racing Group, and previous host of the weekly internet radio talk show, Automotively Speaking. I love that title. He was the contributing <laughs> editor of Modern Gladiator Magazine and was a licensed Colorado independent automobile dealer. You have done it all. Michael earned the Tom Center Award, the Glenn Snyder Award at the Monterey Historics, and the Bill Morton Spirit of the Hill award as well. Ha, huh, a gentleman racer, a man of many talents. We're going to learn a lot more about Michael, but first a word from our sponsors, so please give them a little love. Buckle up. It's going to be a fun ride today, and we will be right back. For several years now, you've heard me talk about Linkage Magazine. I've been a subscriber since the start. They're talented and creative team brings you a spectacular publication and website that shares the automotive passion from a worldwide perspective. Linkage is about driving, restoring, collecting, and first-hand experience at collector car auctions and more. They bring you real-world values plus rational, experienced opinions on the current markets. They cover the automotive world and the people who share our passions. And Linkage Magazine has grown, mailing you six issues annually. Join me on this journey with Linkage. They're geared for the automotive life. You can subscribe at LinkageMag.com. Years ago, when it was time to renew my collector car insurance policy, my carrier's rates went up, way up. But my usage was the same, and I never made a claim. I didn't even have a ticket. So what's with that? So I turned to American Collector's Insurance. Has your collector car insurance recently raised your rates for no good reason? Tired of paying an annual membership fee? Then it's time to look around and call American Collector's Insurance. I shopped around, I asked friends for recommendations, and found a winner 
that I can trust. And boy, I'm glad I did. I saved hundreds of dollars every year and slept better at night knowing my baby was properly insured. American Collectors Insurance have been protecting vehicles since 1976. They provided me with an agreed value insurance policy backed by their history of taking great care of their clients. What could be better than that? So give them a call and ask for a quote today. 866-ACI-YEAH. That's 866 224 9324 and protect the ones you love like I did with American Collectors Insurance. Classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors. Hey, guess what? Some of you regular listeners will remember back in 2019, I created uh, 10, 11 shows called Cars Yeah TV, where I went to some fabulous locations of past Cars Yeah guests and we did a TV show about it. Well, they're up on the Cars Yeah YouTube channel. So go check it out at YouTube. Just type in Cars Yeah, and the shows will be there for you to enjoy. I hope you have fun watching. So, Michael, I don't even know where to start with you. My goodness, you have done so many things. So I guess we start with Car Connections. What is Car Connections? How did it come to be, and what is it? Well, as your kind comments about my bio might suggest, I mean, I'm a car guy. You know, I fell into the uh, passion for cars in my you know, early teenage years and, you know, read all the magazines and went to all the car shows I could and that sort of thing. And so I eventually became, the, you know, the car guy that, uh, you know, friends and family would ask for advice or maybe to hold their hand down at a dealership or something like that. And so after um, I um, after my real estate career, and we can certainly get to that later. If yeah, I missed apropos. I missed that one in the bio. I'm sorry. Holy cow! <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. But uh, I decided that you know, I should do what I love doing, and that's basically playing with cars and helping people. So, so that's how uh, Car Connections evolved. It was basically you know, me being a car guy, you know, helping people do what, uh, frankly, a lot of consumers don't like doing, and that's dealing with some sort of an automotive transaction, whether it's to you know, purchase or lease or order a new car or find a used car or to sell and get rid of the car they currently have or to get a windshield or a tune-up or a detail or whatever. Uh, those are things that uh, those of us in the business and, you know, who have a passion for cars know about. A lot of consumers don't, and it's a hassle for them. So my whole thinking was, let's make the process transparent. Let's make it time efficient, cost effective, and hopefully fun along the way. So uh, that was the evolution of Car Connection. So is this a website? Well, uh, um, most of what I do is is on a one-to-one basis. I, mean, I learned long ago that, you know, you can advertise all day long and that thing, but there's nothing like, you know, talking to somebody eye to eye and really developing trust because, you know, basically Car Connections is a a service organization. You know, I help people accomplish their automotive needs. And so that, you know, whole like trust thing is important. And so I deal with clients pretty much on a one-to-one basis just to help them, as I said, you know, achieve whatever they're trying to do automotively. And that usually takes the form of of helping people to, you know, buy um, or sell a vehicle. Nice. Um, I used to be a licensed dealer, and that was easy. You know, I had inventory, and I had a showroom, and all that good stuff. And um, I'm basically retired from that, but I still help people, as I say, more or less on a one-to-one basis, helping them do whatever it is they want to do, and doing it for them, and making it, again, as easy and hopefully fun as possible. For car guys like you and me and so many listeners out there, all those processes of buying, selling, finding, all that, it's just because we do it all the time. But for most people – Buying a car is scary. It's no fun. And I think that's where our show our companies like Costco, their buying network came about and why they've done so well is because they just make it easy. You don't have to negotiate and go through all the, you know, you go in to buy a car and it takes like a day now. You know, it's like yeah. ter- terrible, right? Well, unfortunately, uh, the you know, automobile business, both, you know, new and used cars has, has developed Unfortunately, a well-earned reputation for not being very consumer friendly. It's a process where they've got all the tools, they've got the vehicles, they've got the experience, and the consumer walks in once every couple of years and tries to, you know, wade through that minefield and end up getting the, the vehicle that they want. Whereas the uh, the focus and the priorities for the uh, salesperson might be slightly different. It might be a different vehicle. It might be a higher commission, so on and so forth. So it's so so it becomes a bit of an antagonistic relationship from the beginning. Right. And that's unfortunate. It is. And now this ties in nicely to another company you're a founder of, the Automotive Consulting Network. Sounds very much the same, or how is it different than Car Connections? 
oh, 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 basically it is um, I package the, the car connections business model that that you know I've developed and basically I I provide it as a business opportunity to other you know, car people like us uh, to other entrepreneurs perhaps somebody who already has an automotive related business and wants to add this component to their business. So basically, I sell my business model, and then I train people in developing that for their individual circumstances and hopefully help help them be successful in the car world doing what I've done. Very nice. Well, you know, you and I are, are I'll call us um, classics. You know, we're rather mature fellows. We've been around for a <laughs> like while. To- Right? <laughs> you yep. like that? With a little bit of patina maybe here and there, oh, which isn't bad. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Maybe, yeah, <laughs> Unrestored. Maybe, maybe a lot in the case of me. And uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on as we're talking about this is how much you and I, particularly in the last 10 years, have seen the buying process with the advent of the internet completely change the way dealers work. And now I'm starting to hear things that a lot of these manufacturers won't even have dealerships in the future it'll all be like buying teslas you know where you just order them and go get them there won't be that experience anymore what, what's your opinion of all that well i think there are um as in the case of most uh, new innovations pros and cons i mean certainly certainly tesla created the model of you know ordering online you can't go into a dealership a tesla dealership if there were such a thing and pick up a car uh, you order one and that works pretty efficiently the downside, of course, is the the personal touch and the touchy feely part of of getting a car. Um, you know, I think those of us who are car enthusiasts feel this very strongly, and others might not recognize it, but it exists. And that is the 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 emotional component of buying a car. You know, whether it's the color you like or the style that attracts you, or whatever. There is, as I say, an emotional component to buying a car, and it's hard to do that online. It's hard to do that remotely. You, know, you can't sit in the car. You can't feel the seat. You can't be excited by the uh, dimensions. You know all those almost intangibles that, again, we car enthusiasts recognize, but I think everybody encounters in one way or the other. That's you know part of purchasing and then owning your car. So you miss that without going in and and actually looking at one. Sure. Would you say it's forced dealers to be sharper? And be better. And and my example is my next door neighbor. Now he's a bit of a car guy, not quite as crazy as I am, but he is a car guy. He's had a lot of cool cars, and he was ready to buy his wife a new car and himself. He knew kind of what he wanted: Audi sedan and a Ford Raptor truck. And after going to local dealers that didn't treat him that nicely or that well, or just something didn't click, he came home, went online, bought two cars. Both came in from different states. You know, a week later they showed up on a truck and. He's done. And he said, wow, that was easy. That was different, but much more pleasurable. So I would assume this has forced dealerships to get a lot sharper in the way they help people buy cars so that because there's now there's competition that's all across the country, right? Well, not only the you know advent, as you say, of more competition, but there's much more information. I mean, that's the big thing the Internet has done for, I think, all aspects of our lives, and that is access to much more information. Hopefully, most of it's accurate, but that's a whole other story. So I think dealers have to deal with more educated consumers. But then don't forget that most car buyers are not like your friends. They don't know what they want. Mm. And so that's the thing that dealers can, if they're a good business enterprise, can help with, but they don't always, which is you know, obviously why a business like mine has, has flourished. I can help people work through that process of what do I really want, what works for me, and what do I feel good about in a manner that's based upon their priorities rather than a salesman who might go through that process with a slightly different agenda. So um, it certainly has created a different buying marketplace. I see dealers getting much more cognizant of the realities of car purchasing. The best example is women. I mean, we've all heard stories and I've personally seen uh, the woman who goes into a dealership to buy a car. And the first question is, where's your husband? You know, and, and <laughs> why do I need one of those? <laughs> yeah. uh, statistically, I understand you know, women buy 60 to 65 percent of vehicles and they probably influence 99 percent of vehicles. And dealers are finally learning that uh, you have to cater to women consumers. You have to have um, women in the business, you know, who can 
often a female consumer is more comfortable with a female salesperson, and dealerships are discovering that. Uh, my wife started in the car business uh, about 20 years ago, and she was one of two female sales uh, representatives in all of the Colorado Front Range. Um, now there are many in most dealerships. So again, I think that's an advent and a development where the dealerships are trying to be more relevant. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I had a wonderful guest on the show to become a friend, Kathy Droz. Uh, she was a guest way... Oh. Do you know Kathy? I know Kathy. I used to see her on a lot of the uh, you know, media gigs that uh, both she and I would go to. In fact, we've shared cars on a number of trips. I know Kathy real well. Red shoes, red heels. Oh, good. Yeah, she's she has the H-E-R, her certified program. Yep. Yeah, where she teaches women how to sell cars to consumers, and specifically women. And I think it's a wonderful thing that she's done. And uh, yeah, she's become a nice friend. In fact, she, she sent me a, a, my coffee mug I have here that has my logo on it. So uh, uh -huh. yeah, she's, she's just awesome. You know, another thing before yeah. we get into... ACP production, because I really want to talk about that, is a little bit about vintage racing, because I did some vintage racing, but you have done a lot of vintage racing. And I wondered if you could share a little bit about how you got involved with it and what were some of the cars that you've raced? Yeah, I've been very fortunate to have really been, um, had the opportunity to, you know, drive and own a lot of wonderful cars. As I said, I mean, I was a car enthusiast you know, all along, and and um, after college and starting to get working and things, I was able to you know start indulging that that hobby a little bit more, and I bought a few cars. And uh, we're talking now the you know mid and late seventies when a lot of what are now considered exotic cars, particularly race cars, were just old cars. Yeah. And so it was obtainable then to you know get a an older Ferrari or an older race car. And so, so I started buying Ferraris in 1975. Nice. Um, and, and then it wasn't hard. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and you, you, we were just, you know, all young guys in our late 20s and early 30s who were just car people. And we'd always, you know, seen pictures and read stories about the Ferraris or, or, you know, or Aston Martins or lots of the exotic European cars. And again, you know, old ones weren't that expensive at that point in time. Yeah. So we were just really being able to enjoy those from the enthusiast point of view, as opposed to from the investment point of view, that of course is how it has evolved over time. Anyway, so I, I answer your question in slightly a long-winded manner. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, um, I bought I was able to acquire a couple of Ferraris, older Ferraris from the uh, mid '60s, and I started, you know, working on those, and I showed them at some concours and that sort of thing. And pretty soon, that got old, and I wanted to actually experience them. So, um, so the Ferrari Club uh, went up to a racetrack in Northern California, and they had a class just for us in our street Ferraris. And this was in 1977. So I went out that day, and I had an absolutely terrible time. Because I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't have any race craft. I didn't have any real racing skills. I, Like most of us, I figured I was a pretty good driver. But you get on the racetrack and you discover that it's not quite as easy as it looks. Mm, right. So I uh, promptly I took the uh, Bob Bonder at uh, High Performance School, uh, which, which at that time was up at Sears Point in Northern California. And that gave me the beginnings of at least understanding about what's involved. And so I started vintage racing. Uh, uh, my first vintage race car was a, uh, a 1959 a Ferrari 250 GT California Spider aluminum body. Ooh, nice. Which is, you know, now a, you know, uh, an eight-figure car. A pricey car. Yeah, uh, but then it was not necessarily. And so that was my first race car. Wow. And then I, I mean, that was wonderful. And there's no sound like a V12. And obviously it was a convertible. And so it was wonderful to drive and exciting. But a big, you know, a big heavy car. And some of my friends, um, I drove one friend's uh, Lotus 18, uh, Farmer Jr. Mm, yeah. um, I drove a, a Lotus 11, and I liked, you know, the, the little light car concept. So I was able to find a, a car out of Canada called the Lucas Whitehead Special that was a home-built um, race car built by a couple of aircraft engineers and was basically a home-built Lotus 11. It had the same Coventry Climax motor and that sort of thing. And that car was just a, a lot of fun to drive. Small, light, nimble, you know, fast enough to scare you and just really fun. Oh, nice. And then I graduated to a Janetta G4 to a, uh, get a little British 
uh, sports racing car that's basically a, uh, a like a Lotus 7, but with closed wheel and a really nice looking, uh, stylish uh, body work. And that car was just, I might beat Shelby Cobras and Mustangs <laughs> yeah. with that. It was a, really a fast little car. A little bit of a giant killer. Yes, totally, totally. And then, you know, being a car guy and kind of a Ford fan, I'd always, you know, had fan issues about a 289 Cobra. So I was eventually able to find one of those and had it restored and, and raced that for quite a while. Nice. And that was a wonderful vehicle. <laughs> You've been in some cool rides. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Very lucky. Very fortunate. Well, hard work. That's how uh, luck happens. I want to talk a little bit about ACP Productions, though, executive producer of this company that you're producing television content. Can you tell me about this company? Yes. Well, well, I'll tell you what I can. It's still in development and there are some NDAs, so I can't okay. tell you everything. But um, essentially, um, ACP Productions is an evolution of um, a um, automotive-based TV series that was on Discovery Channel several years ago with uh, uh, the star John Haynes. And uh, John and um, his partner, uh, Glenn, and myself and my wife have gotten involved in basically doing a sort of a 2.0 level of of the American car prospector, where we're going to be looking at not just cars, but all forms of transportation and the, the stories behind uh, vehicles of all sorts and doing another, basically another TV series about that. Very cool. Yep, it's going to be exciting. So we'll see maybe boats and airplanes as well? After your boats, airplanes, uh, submarines, uh, snowmobiles, oh uh, you know, any, um, any kind of transportational item uh, that, because again, they all have in common certain attributes. And the greatest one for, we hope, the excitement of a TV series is the stories behind them. You know, the people who found them, restored them, built them, designed them, you know, everything has a story. Oh, and those yeah. stories are what really give, you know, depth and excitement and emotional connection about that particular vehicle. Well, geez, Michael, you just get your hands in everything and uh, now, now on to, to TV. But it's all got these connections with cars, which is why when I learned about you, I wanted so very much to have you be a guest on the show. Well, thank you. Well, you're welcome. All of us who are successful usually have what I call a driving inspiration. Somebody, in many cases, many people, but for today, we'll talk about one of those people that were, was very influential and perhaps even a mentor in your life that really helped you along. Is there somebody like that in your, your past? Well, yes. I mean, as you said, Mark, I mean, all of us have had the fortune of encountering people who really have given us inspiration and you helped us along the way. Um, you know, I've got to look at a couple of people from my early real estate days who really helped me understand the foundations of of business and success and of, you know, making, you know, hard work and smart work and really making things uh, your own, so to speak. Um, I had a gentleman by the name of um, George Marcus, who I worked for originally in the real estate field, and he was a very demanding, uh, very successful, but, but very demanding boss. And, and I mean, he really helped me learn that uh, you got to put your mouth where your um, intent is and you got to work hard. You got to produce that, you know, talks cheap. And mm -hmm. what really matters is, uh, is getting results. And then uh, later when I went off on my own and formed my own real estate company, my uh, a partner, a gentleman by the name of Gary Schwing, a former a Marine uh, a pilot, you know, really a sharp guy. Again, the whole principles of taking responsibility and working hard that, Anything is possible and that you can create your own way if you have the guts and the willingness to do what it takes to make things happen. Was your real estate business in commercial real estate or residential or development? Primarily commercial, uh, multifamily. Um, yeah, I helped, uh, um, I helped um, syndicate and, uh, and, and then property manage and in some cases develop and build primarily multifamily uh, properties, apartments and that sort of thing in, in many states. And so, you know, all prospects, you know, you know, um, all aspects of those, again, from uh, construction through uh, management, you know, sales, syndication, um, investments, all those sort of things. Very cool. Well, a shout out, oorah, to uh, Gary as a Marine. My father-in-law yep. was a 30-plus year Marine. So I uh, love the Marine Corps. Yeah, all, all of the, the services, but uh, Marine Corps is extra special in this family. So... I would suspect with all this, these different types of businesses you've been involved in, 
there's probably a few challenges you've come up against. But I'd like to talk about maybe one that when you look back was a real pain in the rear, but you're glad you got to go through it because it taught you a really valuable lesson. It's often painful in the process, but yes, you look back and you say, yes, I did learn something from that. Um, I had my automobile dealership and my automobile business uh, throughout the 2000s. And if we all remember in 2008, 2009, oh there gosh. was a bit of recession. A bit? <laughs> yeah, a bit. And things changed. You had to adapt. And unfortunately, um, I had a horseback riding accident right in the middle of that and broke five ribs and oh. was out of business for a while. And I made some decisions based upon faulty information that, you know, led to some business difficulties. And what I, looked, and what I had to deal with was I had to take responsibility for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the data I got was incorrect, but I made the decisions. Um, you know, I can't blame anybody else. And so, you know, I had to take responsibility for that. And I had to do whatever was necessary t- to correct those problems and to recover from them. So there was that aspect of the other thing I learned that has been very useful throughout my life since is something that Mark Twain said that um, I've had some terrible experiences in life and most of them never happened. <laughs> you know, we worry about things and and we think, oh, my God, what if this happens and this happens and what are the consequences going to be? We spend a lot of time worrying about things and actually, in some cases, experiencing the emotional and physiological effects of worry yeah. and of of terrible things happening when in fact most of those terrible things actually never happen so that was a lesson that you know, helped me kind of level down and not get so so concerned and so anxious about things does so, that make any sense oh, yes it does and i wanted to ask you i mean this is really important because this tight so many people get wrapped around the axle around things that don't even happen me included. You start going into self-doubt. You start going into what if this happens? What if that happens? And before you know it, it's all consuming and you haven't even taken the first step towards the possibility of a misstep. So how have you learned to get away from that? Back back your brain off of that. What are the things that you tell yourself? And I'll give you an example of something different. I had a friend who said I was, I was going to meet with someone a big important client way back. And I was a little intimidated. This guy was a big time developer. He was actually a real estate developer. And I was pitching marketing to do for a high rise he was building in San Diego. And I was really nervous. I'm like, this guy's big league. I'm just this little 27 year old design guy, you know? And I remember my, my past business partner boss, who was so good at, and he goes, it's simple idea, but he said, Mark, he puts his pants on the same way you do. Yep. To kind of so so how would you advise somebody listening out there that does wrap themselves up around the axle to to tell themselves something so they don't do that? Well, anxiousness and fear can create paralysis. Ah. And that's a real problem. And the answer, and this goes back to uh, that first um, boss I mentioned, um, George Marcus. I mean, he told me, take action. Any action is better than inaction. Do something. Even if it's not the right thing, in hindsight, do something. And then course correct if you have to. Just don't get paralyzed. Mm. And so, again, you know, concern, fear, anxiety, all those things are very natural and very strong. And as I found, the best way to come back to them is just to take some action. Just do something. You know, this comes to, to light when it, we, it comes to restoring vehicles. And you can relate to this because you've <laughs> had so many cars. You know, sometimes you get a car and it's overwhelming. And I remember the first time I took my race car all apart. Never done that before. I mean, I'd worked on street cars. And then I had to put it back together. You know, I'd send everything out for crack testing during the winter and all that stuff and mm-hmm. fix some things. And then I had to put it together. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I've never done this. And I had a friend <laughs> who was – he actually worked for me. And he really helped me. His name was Tim. He was so helpful. Uh, he actually used to be a mechanic in real racing and stuff. And he said, Mark, the trick here is at least do one thing tonight. Just one thing. You're looking at the whole picture. Just look at one piece and do that. And then tomorrow night, do it again. And then do it again. And that helped me a lot. Would you agree? Mm-hmm. That is so much in a parallel with with what so many philosophers have said about the longest, you know, or the longest journey begins with a single step. step. Yeah. <laughs> just get off your butt and do something. Right. Move. Yeah. Just move in some direction. You may have to course correct, but move. Yeah, it's the same when you're trying to get physically fit and it overwhelms some people. Oh, I'll just go work out tomorrow. Well, maybe don't exactly. <laughs> maybe don't start with a full workout at the gym. How about just walking around the block today, right? Yeah. And that gets you started. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, it does. Since we're into the world of psychology a little bit here and self-help, I'm going to crawl into your head, okay? 
if you were reincarnated, manifest as a vehicle, this isn't what you want to be, though. That's way too easy. I don't want to be a Formula One car. <laughs> uh, what would you be, but more importantly, why? Oh, that's a good question, Mark. Well, it would certainly be vintage. <laughs> okay. okay, that's a good start. Um, it'd be vintage. It would have uh, uh, carburetors and a clutch and a manual transmission, mm-hmm. and 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 be loud and have a and have a lot of power. But hopefully, um, it would have a little sophistication as well. Okay. And and boy, when I say those things, boy, what comes to mind is a is a Ferrari five twelve boxer. Oh, I like it. Okay. Yeah, the B- BB. Yep. I actually had one of those, so <laughs> I can speak to that firsthand. Well, I got to ask you about that because that car was an interesting car in many ways, but it was one of those cars that was kind of a bit of an outlier, never really gained a lot of traction for a long time, like a lot of collectible Ferraris did, and then finally kind of caught up. And I always kind of wondered because I remember when that car came out, I think it was a black one on the cover of Road and Track with fog all around it or something. When that first came Mm. out as a kid, I went, oh my gosh, this thing is so cool. Why do you think it is that it took a while for that car to finally catch on? Uh, Well, another good question, Mark. Um, I would guess uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it was was a real change. It it was the first mid-engine Street Ferrari. There you go. So that was a change. Um, it had very dramatic, uh, so you know, wedge styling, which also was a change mm-hmm. from the more rounded, like the you know, the uh, the the two seventy five GTB and the Daytona and the cars that immediately preceded the Boxer were more round, and the Boxer was very angular. Um, and also, it was a hard car to drive, very fast, a lot of power, and not easy to drive well. Um, so, so I think all those things, and they didn't make a whole lot of them either. Well, that's true. Uh, beautiful Pininfarina design. You're right. It was a very yep. kind of new look, that sharp front end pointy wedge that they came up with. Mm-hmm. Maybe that was yep. the way. I just always thought it was such a an elegant, and I love the back end. It kind of reminded me of the De Tommaso um, Mangusta a little Mangusta, bit. Mangusta, yes. Yeah, with the way that mm-hmm. back end was, and it was just, I've never had the luxury of driving one. What would you say if you could pick one thing out of the many parts of driving that car that you like? <laughs> <laughs> now well, we got him going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, lots of things. Um, yeah. It had that, you know, now trademark, you know, gated gated transmission, stick shift. That was, again, not easy to operate well. Uh, second gear never works when it was cold. You had to <laughs> go first to third until it got warm. Um, I think, but I think the thing that I liked, thinking back, the... Because it was mid-engine, and of course, you know, 380 plus horsepower, uh, flat 12 behind you, the torque from that, you would get on the throttle that, and it would just settle down. It felt like an inch or two, and then just launch itself. Um, Just, I mean, tremendous acceleration uh, combined with really phenomenal handling. Beautiful car. Awesome. How about a yeah, great book? Great car. Yeah, no kidding. I got to get, have somebody toss me the keys in one of those someday. How about, <laughs> you how, should do it. Should yeah, do it. for sure. How about great reading? Is there a book that you'd like to share that you've really enjoyed? Yeah, maybe a couple of kind of different uh, ends of the spectrum. I think everybody's got to read The Art of War mm, yeah. from, you know, Sun Tzu. I mean, it's very simple. It's easy to read. It's full of lots of philosophical truisms, like, you know, keep your friends closer. Keep your friends close enemies and your enemies closer. closer. Yeah. Are things like that that are, that are so simple but have profound applications in all aspects of your life. Certainly business, but I mean personal life as well. And then another book I read in the 60s that I think was just a sort of revolutionary in what it provided, but in a, in a story form, and that is Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land. Fascinating book. Yeah, nice. You know, The Art of War, long time ago, one of the my first friends when I was a little kid. In fact, we we were very entrepreneurial back when we were eight, nine, ten years old. We started many businesses on our street. One was called the Playboy Bar. I'll just leave it at that. But <laughs> when we were about eight, eight, nine years old, but we we figured out how to make a bunch of money selling sodas by uh, getting people thirsty with popcorn in a little boys club we built in his garage and stuff. Uh, Stefan Fitch, and he went on to be a financier investment professional in London. And uh, way back in the, I think when he had moved to London and I was young and he bought me that book, he said, you should read this book. And I looked at it and I went, oh, Art of War, I'm not going to the military. What's it all? And he goes, no, no, read this book. Yeah. And I've always thanked him for that because, yeah, that's a book everybody should read. I think mean, you should, yep. Yeah. Yep. At least everybody in, in college, uh, at the very least. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It teaches you a lot of things. Very, 
very cool. Well, I'm going to take you on the ultimate drive before I let you go today. I'm going to park any okay. car in the world in your driveway, which given all the cars you've driven, wow, this will be interesting. You can take it anywhere, but here's the key. You can take somebody with you, even somebody who's no longer with us. So somebody from the past. Ooh. So uh, what does the mm. uh, ultimate car look like for you? Well, and again, who to take with you? Probably, yeah. probably if you're going on a, on a long drive, uh, my thinking is you want a grand touring car, a proper GT, something that's going to be comfortable for a long drive, but also have the performance to you know make the most out of what will hopefully be one of the roads along the way. So probably an Aston Martin, oh nice, or maybe okay. a DB11, you know, something yeah. like that. A pretty sophisticated newer um, Aston Martin, which I think and many other automobile enthusiasts would agree have some of the most beautiful cars on the road. Oh my gosh, yes, probably an Aston Martin. Okay. Who are you going to take with? Well, I probably should say my wife. Yeah, uh, I that's, a, would that's the politically correct but, answer. <laughs> it is. It, but again, use it anybody. And I probably Phil Hill. Um, oh, nice. I was fortunate. I was fortunate to know Phil Hill and his wife Alma on um, you know on first name basis. We had many you know picnic meals at concours and racetracks together and things. And fascinating guy, tremendous automotive knowledge, fabulous racing career, and just a neat car guy. So probably Phil Hill. I just send Derek as a guest on the show here, and um, I was so fortunate because when I was racing miniature cars, they invited Phil up to Pacific Raceway to be the. Uh, yeah, it always brings somebody special to the to our big historic races, Fourth of July, and he was the guy. And I was so lucky to get to sit across the table from him with my son, who was oh gosh, probably seven or eight at the time, and have lunch and talk with him. And, you know, I kept saying, kept pinching myself. I, I can't believe I'm sitting here. What a nice man, but what an insightful man. And he yep. talked about more than just cars, talked about life and all sorts of things. And uh, I just always remember back to that. I wish I, I didn't have a camera with me, you know, to uh, record the event, but um, what a special guy. So that sounds like a nice yeah, trip to certainly. me. Uh, sounds pretty me cool. Me too, me too. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. A lot to talk about, a lot to share philosophically, historically, yeah. you know, a lot of great conversation I think could be had with, you know, Phil in a uh, nice, comfortable Aston Martin uh, uh, touring the roads of Europe, perhaps. You know, I had um, not too long ago a guest on my show, Luca DeMonte, who's written a wonderful book. It's an 1,100-page book about Enzo Ferrari. And he got to interview, this book has taken eight years to write, but he got to interview Phil before we lost him, of course, um, about his time with Enzo Ferrari and racing Ferrari. And one of my favorite Ferraris that he raced, the Shark Nose, uh, was just, mm -hmm. you know, that he won the championship in. So that would be pretty cool. Michael, we could talk forever, but we're running out of time. So uh, before I let you go, could you share some parting words of wisdom or advice for our listeners? Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity to chat with you, Mark. I've certainly enjoyed that. I guess two things that have been very important to me, and we're not necessarily talking about automobiles now, we're talking more philosophically, if you will, but two things that, that as I say, have, have been important to me and have helped me put you know, things in perspective. Two things. One, there is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. That there's no way you get happy, you are happy, and then other things develop from there. And the other thing that, that goes back a little bit to what we talked about with Mark Twain's quote earlier, and that is that events and circumstances just are. We give them value. Mm. Something happens and we decide if it's good or bad. We decide if it's scary or exciting. You know, I mean, most everything happens between our ears. Things just are. Events, circumstances, they, they have no value other than what, what, what we give them. So we have the choice to give things positive spin whenever possible. Very nicely said. And this circumstance that brought you and I get together today definitely added value for me and no doubt for our listeners. Before I let you go, uh, how can people keep up with you? How can they learn about ACP Productions? Well, thank you. Um, two websites, uh, certainly um, acpproductions.tv. Um, that is our website, and it's just sort of a beginner, sort of a, a teaser website. Uh, there's certainly going to be more developed there in the near future. And also my car connection site, uh, car connections, which ends with an S, dot U.S. So car connections dot U.S. Uh, talks a little, little bit about you know, that business and what um, I've done and do there. And again, would be happy to uh, help anybody in, in any way that I possibly could if someone would uh, like some help. Awesome. I'll put links to these on Michael's show notes page. Michael Cotsworth, C-O-T-S-W-O-R-T-H. And he is certainly worth talking to. 
Nicely done there, eh? You like that? <laughs> yes. <A> nice segue, Mark. <laughs> you bet. And I also want to do a shout out. Thank you to John Hames. He's a future guest coming up yes, here indeed. on Cars Yeah. He's part of the ACP production team there. So we're going to be learning more from him. Michael, thanks for being so generous today with your time your expertise, and sharing your experiences. Christmas is almost here, so Merry Christmas to you. Indeed, Merry Christmas. Yeah, until you and I talk again, I'll see you down the road and in the new year. Thanks very much, Mark. Look forward to it. You're welcome. Today's vehicles are essentially computers on wheels, and it takes more than a wrench and oil to keep them humming. That's why Cars Yeah! supports TechForce Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to driving tomorrow's workforce of skilled technicians forward. Techs keep our cars, trucks, airplanes, and fleets rolling. Yet there's a massive tech shortage because many young people don't know it's no longer a blue-collar job. Today, it's a new-collar career. It involves computers, technology. It's in high demand. You get paid really well. And you can live and work anywhere in the country. I know you're passionate about cars, trucks, and motorcycles. And you can help pass that passion on to the next generation of techs so our rides keep rolling down the road. Visit techforce.org today and learn how. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah. Yeah.